Hello, my name is Janet Stewart. I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here in Durham University. My title today is The Shape of Things, and I've chosen that contrary to my, to my children's suspicions, not in homage to Ed Sheeran, but actually to recognise an initiative that's been put together by the British Academy, which provides a, an important acronym for understanding the contribution of the social sciences, the humanities and the arts and a counterpoint and a counterbalance to the more uh, memorable or the more or the better known acronym of STEM which is of course something that that, that many of us sort of understand and, and, and recognise. The question then the British Academy poses is the relationship between um, shape on the one hand, the social sciences, the humanities and the arts for people in the economy and STEM on the, on the other. Last year, the British Academy launched an initiative that was designed to begin to float the idea of shape, of these subjects that come together to do something quite particular. These are subjects that help us to understand ourselves, to understand the world around us, to, that provide us with the methods and the forms of expression that we need to build better, deeper, more colourful and more valuable lives for us all. Together with STEM subjects, the British Academy argues, shape subjects help us make innovation work harder for the benefit of everyone and they bring opinion and perspective to our everyday lives. In extraordinary times, it's shape subjects that keep life running, care, communities, economy and the environment sustainable and keep people's spirits lifted. That's the pitch from the British Academy. Now, these are, of course, extraordinary times. And my title today has also been chosen to signal my intention to reflect on how the arts and humanities are placed to help us understand and to respond to our current social, political and cultural situation. To assess, if you like, and respond to the shape of things, but also to actively shape things. We're in an enviable position here in Durham University where we can be justifiably proud of the strength of our Faculty of Arts and Humanities with its top 20 place in the Times Higher World University rankings of 2021, for example. What are the arts and humanities and, crucially, why do they matter? This is a question that's often raised at times of, of financial and political crisis. In the aftermath of the, of the financial crisis of 2008, for example, we saw a rash of important publications that set out to defend the value of the arts and humanities. I might mention as one example there the Cultural Value Project that the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, put in place in 2012. Over a decade later, similar questions are being raised in the context actually of ongoing discussions around the value of higher education itself. And so here in Durham at the university, we've been working as a faculty on articulating what we have to offer and clarifying why the arts and humanities have been and continue to be of importance. So let me just take a second and, and, and read for you the mission statement that, we've put in, that we put in place. In brief, the arts and in the arts and humanities, we nurture thoughtful, critical and engaged citizens for a rapidly changing and complex world. We provide tools for analysis, interpretation and expression. Tools to discuss and compare models of human life and flourishing. Tools for imagining the future. And we do this through engaging in the study of the languages, arts, cultures, philosophies and texts that have shaped our world. Crucially, we open up new perspectives through attending to difference, to different times and places, to different cultures, and to different ways of thinking and seeing, in order to ask difficult questions of the past and present alike, and to enable productive and innovative ways of imagining the future. Now at Durham, this work is grounded in core disciplines. It's grounded in classics, English, history, modern languages, music, philosophy, and theology and religion. But we also have a strong track record of interdisciplinary collaboration across and beyond the faculty, generating new and important knowledge in critical areas, such as health and medicine, uh, digital and data science, environmental sustainability, and creativity, culture, and heritage. 
what are the ways in which the benefits of our work can be seen? Well, this is where I turn to thinking about the current shape of things, starting with the global pandemic, which has given rise to that much vaunted phrase in these unprecedented times. Certainly, there's much about living through a global pandemic that none of us yet fully understand. But in the arts and humanities here at Durham, we're offering practical responses that help make sense of the experience. We're listening to, amplifying and appraising the stories that are being told about lives in lockdown, helping to shape and frame memories of a defining period in the collective consciousness. We're tracking down and evaluating the historical case studies that help us navigate the present situation, not least through a well-received set of podcasts produced by colleagues in our history department, curated by Giles Gasper, under the title Narratives of Resilience, these podcasts have offered reflection on human responses to crisis and disaster at different times and in different geopolitical situations. And what this does is helps to relativise the claim that our current challenges are wholly unprecedented. Meanwhile, our philosophers, led by Nancy Cartwright and working through the Centre for Humanities, Engaging Science and Society, are ensuring that rigorous thinking shapes and guides decision making around responses to COVID-19. Our theologians, through the work of Douglas Davis and the Centre for Death and Life Studies, are helping those confronted with grief and loss to find solace. Colleagues in the Institute for Medical Humanities are enabling those who experience symptoms of COVID-19 to articulate that experience in a way that aids understanding and promotes better treatment. In classics, we're continuing to raise the aspirations of young people whose schooling's been disrupted, and colleagues in English and modern languages and cultures, not least through the work of the Centre for Visual Arts and Culture and the Zerberan Centre for Spanish and Latin American Art, are contributing to the recovery of the cultural sector working on projects that serve to connect County Durham artists and cultural institutions to a network of prominent partners and projects worldwide. But look, COVID-19 and its aftermath, as pervasive as it has been and will continue to be, is not the only issue shaping our present experience. As the UK prepares to host COP26 in Glasgow this year, we're receiving currently, of course, news of disastrous flooding in Germany and extreme heat in Western North America. And at Durham, Colleagues in Arts and Humanities have been responding to and framing questions relating to climate change through the work of the Centre for Cultural Ecologies. My own work in this area has seen me working on a project with colleagues from Sweden and the Netherlands as well as UK around climate imaginaries, around the narratives, the kinds of narratives, the forms and the, and the, and the content of the stories that we tell in order to enable productive ways of imagining different futures in relation to climate change trying to think about how better to make climate change really matter socially and culturally. Questions such as this are given a particular twist in the UK at the moment against a political climate cli characterised by polarisation in the wake of Brexit, shaped by Black Lives Matter and other movements that draw attention to and challenge structural inequalities. This has given rise in some quarters, perhaps as a, a, as a response to the idea of culture wars. Here, as with COVID-19, the arts and humanities can be instrumental in offering perspectives, providing, for example, detailed reflection on the culture wars, the Kulturkampf, that took place in Germany in the 19th century between state and church as Bismarck took on the Catholic Church. Dwelling on the experience of that period is articulated through literary works, I'm thinking of the works of Fontana, Rabe and, and others, as well as other sources, and reflecting on the long aftermath of that experience within the German context and indeed within the European context. The very idea of a culture war can be instrumentalised, as well as the sometimes unpredictable and unexpected consequences of ideological battles, provides a solid basis for us to step outside of the logic of the present and to deploy different and thoughtful perspectives on some of the current flashpoints, such as the idea of freedom of expression. Colleagues here in the Arts and Humanities at, uh, at Durham, whose work centres on these areas, whether through, for example, a focus on censorship in Franco's Spain, or through public speaking in Cicero's Rome, are well placed to add much needed nuance to what can be bluntly and unhelpfully polarised debates. As I hope these brief examples demonstrate, in responding to the state of things, 
the arts and humanities in Durham and more generally are well placed to shape matters, to enable transformative solutions to be developed, to be communicated, to be shared. In shaping things then, the arts and humanities matter greatly and they matter now. <laughs>